So John Medved, it's such a pleasure to be sitting here with you in your home in Jerusalem. And the New York Times supplement named you as one of the top 10 most influential Americans on Israel. The Jerusalem Post named you in the top 50 most influential Jews in the world. You've got an incredible CV, an awesome family, and now you lead and founded, you know, the most incredible crowdfunding platform in the world. So I think we should start with the deep and meaningful. Why the Hawaiian shirts? <laughs> Because I was born in California, I spent a lot of time in Hawaii. Um, it speaks deeply to who I am. Uh, I am informal. I uh, am fun-loving. Uh, I sort of fancy myself a little bit of a rebel. I'm overweight, so the Hawaiian shirt is forgiving. Um, and I live in a really hot climate here in Israel. And you got to be crazy not to wear cool linen or polyester and uh, you know I'm at the age where I, I, I really don't do well with you know heavy metal t-shirts or things that are particularly cool for young people so you know I'm a Hawaiian shirt guy and I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. So, so to be serious one of the things that I've found fascinating and interesting is I've sat down with you when you've drilled potential entrepreneurs Sometimes it's been the most exhilarating and exciting. And to be honest, sometimes I've found it very difficult. And I want to know, you know, what are the attributes you're looking for in a young entrepreneur or in their idea? There's a lot of magic that goes on in this sort of investment. Investor meets entrepreneur first uh, contact kind of thing. And it sounds like a romance for a marriage. Like it, first of all, if, if there's sense. no romance, it's not going to happen. Oh, wow. There's got to be something... Um, a, a little bit akin to the romantic because you're really, it's interesting. People say, well, aren't you bored after having, we've, we've been pitched 6,000 times wow. since our crowd started. Now, if you go back to my, you know, prior life, I think I'm well over 10,000, maybe 20,000 pitches of the last 30 years. So I've, I've, I've heard a lot of pitches and I got to tell you, it doesn't get boring. In fact, the more pitches you've heard, the better it is, because then all of a sudden those remarkable pitches, the, the signal spikes up above the noise. There's a lot of noise. But then when all of a sudden you hear this amazing pitch, it's magic. It's like you're sitting there, your, your mind races ahead, you start thinking about new worlds. And uh, there's a lot of, lot of excitement between uh, the entrepreneur and the investor at that point. So I guess these broad things are going to have huge impacts on our day-to-day -day life. And you just listed off some companies like in your spare time. I'm sure you can go on forever and I've heard you do that. What's our life going to look like differently? What's your grandkids going to, what's the world going to look differently in terms of the daily interactions, a day they walk by? What's it, how's it going to look different? You know, we've seen autonomous cars and we've seen smartphones, but what's the next level going to look like? Well, first of all, a lot of people, unfortunately, are going to lose their jobs. And we become aware of that. People are hearing that. We're not getting ready for it. And this is a societal dislocation in process now, which is going to be horrific for many, many families and many people. And How long are we talking here? We're talking 10 to 20 years. That soon? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's really, I mean, think about how many people make a living driving, right? Truck drivers and bus drivers and cab drivers and delivery, all that's going away. Um, you look at how many people are involved in the service economy who sit and work in call centers. That's all going away. Uh, we've already seen what's happened in malls and in uh, you know, commerce. Um, there's so much disruption on the way. And these people, obviously, we need to retrain who we can. But we need to focus really on the next generation and make sure that we're giving people who are now in school the tools to really adapt and to, and to compete successfully in this next generation of, of job skills. So the country is innovating in just a whole bunch of areas. So I, I think that while things will be different, we'll have a lot more time on our hands 
But on the other hand, people like us who are creative, who are part of the creative class, and the creative class runs the gamut from business to academics to religious studies to uh, artistic endeavor, you're never going to have time. Okay, you're always going to, and in fact, today, given this, this huge fire hose of information and, and connectivity that we have to so much going on in the world, somehow time being filled is never a problem for me. It's the opposite. It's how do I get off the grid? How do I sit down and, you know, play ball with my grandkids? How do I sit and read the paper or read a book? Now, thank God there's Shabbat, because if there wasn't Shabbat and there was an enforced 25-hour, uh, you know, call it tech or information fast, okay, which I think is a great thing for everybody, whether you're religious or not, get on that fast program. It is a real lifesaver. I, my, my, my sense is that there's going to be so much change in the ability for us to get things done quicker, easier, to create companies easier. I mean, if you look at the whole process of company creation, today you don't need to buy expensive software to, to start a company. You don't need to buy expensive computer hardware, you just you know, lease bandwidth or servers you know, on the cloud. You don't need to even hire up full-time people. You can lease them, you can rent them, you know, rent a coder on, online. You can get a virtual team put together. You can buy a logo for five bucks on Fiverr. I mean, it's unbelievable how easy it is to do things that used to be very, very hard. And I think that the, the future is gonna to belong to those people who are using their, their, their brains to innovate. And, and if you look at uh, Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, he talks about entrepreneurship and he talks about the delusional nature of entrepreneurship. That for you to actually believe that you can make it work yourself, you have to be delusional because the odds are against you. you know, Eight, nine of, of, uh, out of 10 startups are gonna fail. But what he found is that to the extent groups of people believe in this delusion together, this delusion, they actually change the odds. That as a group, as an ecosystem, we actually make these miracles happen. And I think that's what's going on in Israel. And it's happening not just in the tech area, but in almost every creative uh, field of endeavor. And the question is with the vast factions here, they don't even chat to each other. They're only seeing their own audience on the, on the social media feeds, only speaking to each other and only talking about the other, whether it's secular and Haredi, whether it's everything. I, I think it's so How do we work that out? It's though? incredibly boring to be that narrow, okay? And, the, and to be born into the Jewish tradition gives you this blessing of Yachad Shifte Yisrael. There are 12 tribes, probably today more, you know, they've split and we've got Chetzi Shvatim and all kinds of, but I want to embrace it all, okay? In other words, I was born to a, you know, mom who was a refugee from Germany and a father whose family came from, you know, the Ukraine. My father always thought that somehow we were Sephardi because, you know, our name Medved means bear in Russian, but he thought it was Mid David. Yeah. Okay, and I always, I always resonated, right? Like, I love and dig Moroccan and Yemenite culture and the Ethiopian. I, I find the fact that there are so many different kinds of Israelis exciting. I don't like it's too, it's just so stupid to say, well, I, you know, I'm going to stay in my little group. I think it's wrong for religious people and observant people to say, well, you know, these secular people, they, they're not part of my, my, my tribe. I love them. They are, they are part of the Jewish people, they are, the, you know, critical to where we are, okay? People who bash the Haredim, okay? People who bash, you know, uh, progressive or liberal Jews. It's stupid, the whole thing is so incredibly, and, and it, you're right, and that is a huge challenge. But how do we get them to realize that? How do we actually, somehow bring them a little bit closer to realize exactly what you're saying. It's that, you know what Rabbi Sachs calls the dignity of difference. How do we create that? Well, I think you have more people like Rabbi Sachs, okay? You know, more people like yourself, good rabbinical leaders who can sort of, you know, call on, 
on Jews to be tolerant and to embrace each other, okay? We do. Look, we do it in the army, and that's why the army is so important, and that's why it's so important that Haredim don't be forced into the army, but be, you know, embraced, embraced into, the, in, in, into the army. Because that naturally breaks down any of those We do it in the workplace, Yeah. okay, where all of Israelis get together. We do it on Yom HaTzma'ut, okay? In other words, I was, you know, on the beach on Yom HaTzma'ut watching, you know, just the, 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 the nation of Israel, and there were people with head coverings and completely covered, and people with string bikinis, and you know, families, and it was you just- You weren't watching the bikini part. I, I, I was watching it all, okay? <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was just spectacular in this, and, and you know, it's like food, I don't know, I'm, I, I love food. But to, to my mind to say, well, no, you should only eat Italian food all the time, or, you know, have hummus, you know, I love hummus, but I want to have it all, okay? And I think that embracing this breadth, this is what's exciting, because you can be, you know, a proud Jew, a proud Israeli, and, and, and embrace all of it. Embrace even the non-Jewish cultures here in the country, okay? You know, be, be proud of the, of the Circassians and the, and the Druze and the Arabs and the Bedouin. I mean, it's, it's really about being inclusive. And enough of this sort of like throwing stones, and I, and I think, by the way, the majority of Israelis reject that sort of sectarian, sectoral uh, division. I think that they respond better to people who are putting us together. And you know, we talk about impact investing and we talk about considering the ramifications of investments. Now, let's be real, it's not always the best for profit if we're considering those areas. We've got this catch cry. Oh, I disagree completely. So, so in other words, I think, I think that people have this notion that there's a false dichotomy. There's a, uh, between you have to choose between making an impact or making money. And I, I like mashing this stuff up. I, what I love about what's going on now in Israel is there's a ton of social entrepreneurship, wonderful projects which are using the language taken and the metaphors and the, and the business models from the tech sector and moving them into you know, the, the, the social good. And the, the many of the entrepreneurs are building companies which are having a huge impact. If you look at what we're doing in Africa in terms of solar power, we're making money doing it, okay? We're, 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 we're solving uh, disease issues and making money doing it. And I think that, you know, doing them both, that's what guarantees the, the ability for these companies to be sustainable, okay? And to make an impact at the same time. Look, some people are going to be involved in social, charitable things, and that's great. But to the extent that they can use the, um, the metaphors and the, and the language of, of uh, our innovation economy, talking about return on investment, talking about KPIs, talking about how to measure your success, that's good for the social cause. To the extent that our entrepreneurs have fire in their eyes because they want to solve global problems, we're going to make a lot of money with that. Because it turns out that there are six billion or seven billion people on the planet who have not been the focus of the initial wave of entrepreneurship. It's been mostly for rich people's problems. The next set of problems are gonna be solving food and water and energy and you know, how to live in, in, in reasonable cities. And people are gonna solve these big social problems and make a lot of money doing so, in my opinion. When you, when you reflect back on this life and this you know, incredible career, is there any you know, one or two moments that you can pinpoint as saying, this was you know, one of my proudest moments in my career, or this is something that I really am glad I was involved in? Look, I think turning points. I remember how I got into technology in the first place, which was my late father, Dr. David Medved. He was a physicist, you know, he had an incredible life. He grew up, uh, as the son of a barrel maker, parents didn't speak word of English, were Yiddish speakers in the south side of Philadelphia. He put himself through 
college, got his PhD in physics and moved out to California so he could be a rocket scientist and a surfer at the same time. And when um, I moved to Israel, he came over to check out how things were doing with me here and uh, took me along to a meeting which sort of changed my life. And that meeting was with some guys at Raphael, which is the Missile Authority, the same people who work with uh, MPRESS that I'm now an investor in. And I sat around with them as they were talking fiber optics. My dad was building a fiber optics company at the time. And it was Chinese, it was just like so alien and I had nothing to do and I was a little bit bored. Um, and I remember that one of, the, uh, one of the scientists turned to me and said, okay, young Medved, what do you do here in Israel? And I told him that I was lecturing to some student groups and doing some informal guiding. And he said, total waste in Hebrew. My father couldn't hear it. And I said, what do you mean total waste? And he goes, we need what your dad's doing. This was 1982. There was not a single venture capital fund. There weren't, a, you know, the whole startup nation culture. He said, go build a factory for your father to build fiber optic communications. And literally that meeting changed my life. Okay. I remember coming back from Haifa with my dad and said, dad, what do you do? He goes, son, it starts with Ohm's law. And he tried to, you know, I'd never studied engineering or science. And uh, it, it sort of led me on a path that led me ultimately to, uh, you know, get excited about technology and investment. And I built a company with him, which we, was successful, and that got me started. Unbelievable. Well, this has been, like all our conversations, and your, like your life, funny, interesting, engaging, inspirational, educational. And I think, you know, you should just be continued to be enabled to enable others' dreams. And you should just be blessed with success so that you can see the success of others. Because you're really crowdfunding a world. You're really crowdfunding a movement. And you should be blessed to continue to be an ambassador, not just of our people, but of humanity itself. So thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to many more conversations. Thanks, John. Thanks.